الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين so we recited up to uh, ayah uh, 17 from surah Saba. and today inshallah we'll continue uh, from where we left off with Allah ta'ala now uh, when, when I, t I told the story of Saba uh, last time uh, it, it seemed as if the story was almost over uh, meaning uh, the point was made uh, the, or the comparison was was uh, was fulfilled uh, partially um, but there are still there are still two more verses that are talking about this story uh, there's still two more points that Allah subhanahu wa is going to make regarding regarding the people of Saba um, re remember that uh, Surah Saba is talking about the concept of, of obedience or submission um, or fellowship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala following his order obedience submission to everything he says uh, it's, it's, it's following in the footsteps of, of Surah al -Ahzab. he's going to continue to do that in Surah Al-Zumar but the angle here is different the angle here is that of a social one it's looking at societies and um, civilizations and how obedience and submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also important for society. It's not just for individuals, it's not just for people, it's also for groups. And uh, the importance of, of submission or the form of submission that societies show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is quite different than the form of submission that individuals show uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not the same thing, alaykum salam. It's not the same, alaykum uh, salam. It's quite different. So the forms of submission that we show as individuals in, in our lives uh, are, vary. But the forms of submission that societies show is, is pretty much is pretty similar. It's a couple of points that are almost the same. And that's what the surah kind of talks about. And it brings that up right off the bat, right in the beginning. Within the introduction, it goes to a number of, of points. And then it opens a comparison. It tells you st two stories, two opposite stories. The stories of Dawood and Sulaiman as two civilizations or societies that had all the components of thriving and they submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that got, granted them continuity and it granted them uh, prosperity and, and fruition for a very long time. On the other side, you had Saba, who also had all the elements and components of, of thriving and, and, and of prosperity. However, they were missing, they were missing the point of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But you're probably thinking, well, what does is, what is submission uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala look like in the form of society? Does it, have a specific, does it have a certain nature? Does it look a certain way? It does. And it came up in the first story and it came up in the second story. In the first story, um, in two words. The first time they were told, وَعْمَلُوا صَالِحًا Use what you have, use what you were given for the betterness of everything, for the betterment, for good. That was the first one. The second one, اِعْمَلُوا آلَ دَاوُدَ شُكْرَ uh, It was showing, showing gratitude. Societies that will thrive, societies that, societies that submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they'll do that through using what they have for goodness of others, and they'll do it through showing gratitude, by giving back, by not being wasteful, by not harming others with what they have. That's how you show gratitude. You don't harm someone with what you were given, you don't waste it, and you give back to those who don't have what you have. That's how, that's how gratitude and thankfulness is shown as a society. So that was for Dawood and Sulaiman, that was clear, and there was a couple of points that we made when we read, when we read that story, which is important. But when we look at the opposite, opposite story, which was the story of Saba, they existed at the same time, just in a different part of the land, not too far away, a thousand kilometers to the south uh, of where Sulaiman and Dawood were, alayhi salatu wasalam, in Yemen, they also, they also had all the components and elements of prosperity, they were also, they were also very uh, powerful, and they had equity, and they had equality, and they had uh, social uh, <coughs> security, and they had technology, and they had warfare, and they, they had everything that they needed in order for them to thrive, but they missed that one point. They didn't have that element of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was going to show itself in shukr again. That's why you find um, in, in the beginning, كُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِ رَبِّكُمْ وَاشْكُرُوا لَهُ They were told at the beginning when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about how Saba فِي مَسْكَنِهِمْ آيَةٌ Where they lived, there was a sign of His greatness and where they lived. There was so much prosperity. Was so, <laughs> there was so, the, the land they lived in was so rich. And it was so generous and it gave them everything they need. بَلْدَةٌ طَيِّبَةٌ وَرَبٌّ غَفُورٌ A beautiful country and a very forgiving Lord for sins. But كُلُوا مِنْ رِزْقِ رَبِّكُمْ Eat from what He gave you. وَشْكُرُوا لَهُ show, And show gratitude. فَأَعْرَضُوا They turned their backs to that. فَأَرْسَلْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ سَيْلَ الْعَرِيمِ وَبَدَّلْنَاهُمْ بِجَنَّتَيْهِمْ جَنَّتَيْنِ ذَوَاتَيْ أُكُلٍ خَمْطٍ وَأَثْرٍ وَشَيْءٍ مِّنْ سِدْرٍ قَلِيلٍ They turned their backs, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent upon them, upon them a flood, the flood of Arim. And that re replaced the two uh, large orchards that they had, meaning they had two orchards, and the idea of two orchards means that they're surrounded from both sides. 
from both sides, it's just it's green wherever you look. And those two uh, huge pieces of land that were green and that were generous were substituted with also two pieces of land. They didn't lose the land. This the land stopped giving. Now they had uh, what, what they had instead ukul uh, al meaning what, what the the earth started growing trees that gave bitter fruit. Wa uh, and trees that didn't have fruit at all. Wa shay'im min sidrin qalil and some trees that are evergreen but the numbers were low and they didn't have fruit either. So they didn't lose the land. They didn't lose the green. What did they lose? Yeah, the barakah is gone, right? And of course, it's going to be reiterated again in the surah, in the ayah, just so you see how the Quran is very consistent with the ideas. This is how we reward them. This is how we treated them. This is was this was their, the, the consequences they got for their kufr. The kufr here doesn't mean lack of iman. Kufr here means refusal to be grateful. The concept of kufr in its essence is for you not to want to identify with a blessing. I Meaning you don't recognize a blessing, that's what kufr is. How did kufr become the opposite of iman? Because when you refuse to recognize the greatest blessing of all, which is life, meaning you refuse to, to accept that life is a blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so you say, he didn't create me, then that's what becomes the opposite of iman. So kufr is a simple concept. It's just I don't want to, I don't recognize this as a blessing. You gave me something, no you didn't. You have no fadl over me for giving it to me. I mean, I don't owe you anything, you didn't do it. And it just keeps on going up until you hit the biggest blessing of all, life or Islam. And you refuse to recognize as those two things as something that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it turns, it turns kufr from just refusal of blessing to actual uh, disbelief altogether. So here it's talking about kafir as a concept of them not wanting to show gra gratitude. وَهَلْ نُجَازِي إِلَّا الْكَفُورِ And do we punish anyone besides someone who refuses to be grateful? No one gets punished besides that. What, any bad thing happens to you in your life. It's not a punishment. Unless you lived a life of, of no gratitude at all. And even in that case, it was a temporary punishment to, so you could dodge the bullet of the long-term punishment coming later. Yawm al -qiyamah. So really nothing in dunya is a long-term punishment. It's only a punishment if you react to it in a way that turns it into a punishment. Everything else, everything that happens to you, can be a blessing if you just react to it in a proper way. And even if it was intended as a punishment, because you did something wrong, you deserve to be woken up. You deserve a little slap to kind of wake you up for what you were doing. It's only a punishment if you refuse to, to awaken, if you do what they did here. So this is the, this is the exact story. This is, and society is functioning like that, by the way. And I think the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings this into light through talking about societies, not individuals, is, is a very important point. The societies can, can function like that. Societies have that, uh, have that trend, have that bad nature. Uh, when things don't go their way, they become very, the akhlaq are lost. Um, good behavior is, uh, uh, good behavior and, and values and integrity is gone when you don't, when societies don't get their way. And that is a, that, that's a very scary thing to see. It's a very scary thing to witness. And that's why you ha we all have to watch the way we behave. It's very important. Um, you can follow the rules. If you just follow the rules when things are going well, and if you stop at the red light and you let someone in front of you uh, and you open, hold the door for people, only when things are going well, and when they're not going well, you stop caring and you're going to charge ahead and you just make sure you get it. That's a scary, that's a scary thing. That tells us something, something's not wrong. That you were doing it for the wrong reason to begin with. And your understanding of why you were being someone who was kind, why you were being someone who was selfless, why you were following the rules and being and participating positively with, to the society that you lived in was for the wrong reason. You only did it because you got your way. So now when you don't get your way, you stop doing it? That's, that's problematic. And this is, this is what the example here comes. See, when everything was going well for them, they were happy, they were a prosperous country. They didn't show shukr to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they were happy. And then that was taken away. And they were punished for their lack of gratitude. For what, right? So what happened then? Did they wake up as a society? Did they become better? Did they improve? Did they say, okay, we, we, we were wrong. And you find a lot of examples like that in the Quran. Of people who, who will be you know, given a little, uh, thrown a curveball. And then they wake up and figure out, yeah, we were wrong. We, should, we shouldn't have done that. And we should now try and fix it again. Like the three young men, right? When they went and they wanted to take all the, uh, the fruit from their, father, uh, for their father's orchard when he died and, and, and sell it. When it all happened, they, they, they recognized they made a mistake. And after they lost the orchard, after the orchard was burnt to the ground, they regretted what they did. And they said, yeah, we were wrong. It's our fault. We shouldn't have thought like that. And they, and they made tawbah. 
And there's a lot of examples like that, but the people of Seba had a different uh, trend. And this is very scary, it's very important that we uh, recognize, because I can see so many uh, parallels of what, of, what, of what this story tells in our own lives. It's not even funny, it's actually very scary. You can see the same parallels. You don't get what your way, you don't get your way, it's not ha going your way, you're not getting what you want, you're not fulfilled, you don't feel like you're, how do you behave? Do you still follow the rules? Are you still a good person? Are, are, is your integrity still in, intact? Are, are you still ethically impeccable? What, what, what's going on? Or, or is it just a matter of time before you lose your ethics as well? Because things stop going. It's easy to be a good person when you're wealthy. It's easy to be a good person when you're healthy. It's easy to be a good person when you're not under stress and not in difficult times. But, it's, but that's not submission. And that's not what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is looking for. And this is why this came here in Surah Saba and the uh, in the comparison of two groups comparison of the two groups so we'll recite ayah number 18 and 19 and you'll see how after they were punished for not showing gratitude this is the form of submission societies have is gratitude is, is using what you have for the good of others and yourself and not wasting and not using it for harm that's how societies show, show submission and they don't do it for gain so this is the point we don't do it for gain we do it for the sake of Allah and there's a difference you can, you can stand by other communities that are in need if you feel there's gain I mean, you're going to take, you get something in return. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, no, you do it, shukur. Out of, out of gratitude to himself, it doesn't, have, there's not, it doesn't have to be any gain. You just do it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You're not waiting for something to come back in return. And that's the difference between a Muslim society, a submissive society, a society that follows the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, obeys Allah, and a society that doesn't. And it's very simple. And if you want to look at the, when you look at uh, world politics or international politics, the, the politics are the most dirty, dirty thing you'll, you'll ever see in your life. The dirtiest things, the biggest riba exists on an international level. Uh, the biggest uh, rip-offs and, 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 and enslavement and it happens on an international level, not on a, not on a personal one. You're worried about yeah, the car loans and house loans. Go, f go see what happens happening between countries. Go look at what countries are doing. And understand that countries that are in debt, but are taking money anyway, so that their people can live luxurious lives, and they're never going to pay you back, and other countries are starving. You understand that the, the, the wealth that this country has is not its wealth. They don't really own this, it's not theirs to begin with. They shouldn't have it. And others are, 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 just, are just swimming in debt. And we're talking about country, on, on, the, on the levels of countries, on societies, not on individuals. When a country is swimming, swimming in debt, that's a different thing. When a country can no longer support its citizens with health care. That's what happens. These things, these things that fall off. One day there's health care. After a few years, the country says, okay, it's now privatized. And we all are like, oh, it's fine because you're not sick. That's why. Because you're not sick right now. Yeah, whatever. Is that what happened right now? Now we don't care for the, for the health or the well-being of, 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 of the health of our individuals, of our, of our populations. Why? Because we're in so much debt to other countries. They're going to have proper health care, but we're not. I mean, Social Security is taken away, but you don't care because you're still young and you can work. <laughs> but, but now there's a whole demographic of people who are disabled and who are sick and who are addicted and who are you know, broken families. They, they don't have enough, but they're not going to get any more. And other countries are. Because of de this is where this is where the dirty politics come in. This is what we don't pay attention to at all because we're out of that realm. We don't really think about it. We don't see it, and we're on the better side of things, so it doesn't really touch us that much. We're, we live in a country where there is social security, where there is health free health care, where there are uh, universities, and there are loans so that you can go and study. You don't have to have money to actually do it, and you can. And if you live and minimum wage is good enough for you, if if you work for eight hours a day, uh, uh, six five days a week, I, doing anything, you have enough money to pay rent and to eat and to. You know, and, and to have a small car and to move around and to go places and to other people around the world don't have the luxury of doing that. They, they work 20 hours and more and seven days a week and they still can't, can't meet ends at the end of the year. Yeah, have ends meet at the end of the month. Things differ. When we talk on, on levels of countries, it's a whole different thing. So here, that's the level it's talking about and it's worthy of, um, it's worthy of, 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 of yeah, any, uh, thought and reflection. So we recite, inshallah, ayah number 18 from Surah Sabah. A'udhu billahi minash shaytanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. وجعلنا بينهم وبين القرى التي باركنا فيها قرى ظاهرة و 
وَقَدَّرْنَا فِيهَا السَّيْرِ When we stop, the ra becomes raqiq. So it sounds as-sayr. And if you were continue, it sounds as-sayra. Ra, it'll become mufakham. So if you were continue, because it has a fatha on it, it's mufakham, but you stop. Why, why is it raqiq when you stop at it? Yeah, because of the ya sakin before. Whenever there's a ra sakin and a ya sakin before, the ya ra is always going to have, always going to be in raqiq when you stop and you, you don't continue. Siru fiha layaliya wa ayyaman amineen. Faqalu rabbana ba'id bayna asfarina. وَظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَادِيثِ وَمَزَّقْنَاهُمْ كُلَّ مُمَزَّقٍ إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَآيَاتٍ لِكُلِّ صَبَّارٍ شَكُورٍ so Saba at one point was very prosperous, they were very rich, they were very wealthy. Agriculture was their industry and it was, it was awesome, it was beautiful, they had everything they wanted. For many years they lived and they showed no submission in the form of gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any way. And eventually it was taken away from them replaced with something less prosperous. Something that didn't have the barakah that they had previously. And, uh, and this was the punishment they got for the lack of gratitude. This is, this is what we read last time. So now they don't have the ability, they're not self-sufficient uh, anymore as a country, as a civilization. They have, to go, they have to go and buy and sell, and they have to do more trade with other, other people, they have to go find ways to make money. So because they were becoming poor, and people up in the north towards uh, yani Damascus and, and Jerusalem, there was much more money and the trade was much better there. They started to make these trips. These are the tra trips that later on became traditional in Arabia. Meaning these are the trips of Rihd al-Shita al saif that came from, this, this is where it came from. After that flood happened and it destroyed a lot of the land and so much water killed off trees that need water in certain amounts and, and they died off and other trees that came that didn't need as much water and it just changed the, 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 the way uh, the, the, green, the greenness of the land functioned altogether. They needed to start doing more trade, right? وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ وَبَيْنَ الْقُرَى الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا and, and we placed or made between them سَبَأْ and the qura or the, the cities or the, the, the societies التي باركنا فيها which the ones that we placed barakah in who is he talking about here? the same, no no, the people you just talked about a second ago yeah, Dawood and Sulaiman's group so, so it's actually talking about, yeah so it's actually talking about the civilization of Dawood and Sulaiman up in the, up in the north in Bilad al-Sham where Dawood, uh, his kingdom existed in Jerusalem and everything around it and these were places that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had blessed he had put his blessing in, his barakah in it. Why? Because i'malu saliha, i'malu ala Dawood shukra, and they listened. So they had barakah in everything that they did. So they were places that were blessed. So now Saba had to leave where they were and go and do trade with the, with the, with, with, with the cities that had blessings in them, that were blessed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we made between them, this is what the ayah is saying, we made between them and the cities that we had blessed, talking about uh, Dawood and Sulaiman up in the north, Quran Zahira. Um, there were stops on the way. I mean, there were small cities on the way. وَقَدَّرْنَا فِيهَا السَّيْرِ Now these cities on the way made it possible for them to make the journey. If the journey was a thousand kilometers from Yemen to Bidad al-Sham, they couldn't have made it. Because that's it's too long and it's too, people can't sustain themselves. But because there were smaller cities on the way, Quran Zahira, cities that were apparent, you, could, you knew where they were. So they could stop, sell and buy, stop, sell and buy. They could make it up there. And then on their way back, they'd do the same thing. They would come back with some wealth. 
this is exactly what Quraysh did for years and years after. This is exactly what Arabs did for many, many years. They would choose to go to, to the south to the Yemen or to go to north to Sham. Either way, that's how they made their uh, the trade on that same line because that's where all the cities existed. You made that train, you made that line. You went up for, through Mecca, Ta'if, Medina. You kept on kept on going up and came back again. The same cities. Everyone lived there. That's where you did the trade. This is how people sustained their lives. This is how you got what you wanted. It was very hard to come buy a good pair of shoes back then. Shoes were it was a big deal. If you had two pairs, if you had a pair of shoes, you were wealthy. If you had another one, you were filthy rich. Yeah, yeah, and, and usually you had you, you you hid those two pair of shoes, and your wife didn't know about them because she, there's gonna, definitely a family member who doesn't have a pair of shoes who definitely need, you need it, but you don't want to give it away because it's so hard to come buy something good to put on your feet. And we don't we take it for granted because you can just go buy something from Skechers or or Walmart or whatever. But it's hard to come by it if you're walking in the desert. Right, and yeah, it's very difficult to like, come by something that will keep your feet from from fall, from, from your, your your toenails from falling off, and from your, your feet turning into something that you don't recognize anymore. Coming by food, coming by come, uh, to come by uh, barley and, and, and wheat and rice and uh, and lentils was not an easy thing. Coming by armor, something to protect yourself at a time where it was very easy to be raided by anyone. You know, the, the lack of security was the biggest issue of any country back in the back you know back in these eras. So for you to have places to stop by, to trade and get what you needed in terms of food and clothing and other stuff, that was a big deal. So وَجَعَلْنَا بَيْنَهُمْ وَبَيْنَ الْقُرَى الَّتِي بَارَكْنَا فِيهَا قُرًا ظَاهِرًا Maybe between them, between the blessed cities that they were going to do, go trade with, cities on the way that they were able to stop by on, so they could make it. So, th so why is that here? It's saying we didn't take everything away from them. They weren't left with, with no means at all. I Meaning we didn't substitute the land for them to the point where they had nothing going for them. They're going to die. No, we made sure they had a route to take them up north to make, to make a living. They had an ability to go back and forth to make a living. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it of ease for them to do so. Siru fiha layaliya wa ayyamin aminin. And they were told, go ahead, walk. Walk in aminin, it means in peace, without fear of being harmed by anyone. Layaliya wa ayyamin days and nights and days. Meaning, go walk on, around uh, through these routes, taking you up north, uh, days and nights, in يعني, with peace and in safety to, make, to, to achieve what you wanted to achieve. But of course, this was not as good as what they had before. This wasn't as good as it was before. Not as good. Now they have to actually go for long distances. If you were living there at the time, prior to the flood, you owned land that produced a lot of fruit and a lot of vegetables. And you ate and you drank and you were wealthy, you didn't have to go anywhere. Right? Your job was easy, you, you lived on a big farm, and you were quite wealthy, and things went nicely for you. And then the flood happened, and your trees died. And you tried to grow something, and all that grew were khamt and athil and sidr. Things that don't produce anything that tastes good. There's no barakah in it anymore. And you couldn't make a living off it. So yeah, now, for in order for you to make a living, you have to get up and you have to walk a thousand kilometers up north, to trade and buy and make a living, but it worked out, meaning you could do it. Meaning you did it one year, it was fine. I actually made the, I made it, it was safe. There's a lot of steps on the stops on the way. I, I wasn't starving, I, and I came back with a good with a good amount of money. It's enough for the year. Next, I'll do it again. So things went. This is the whole idea of the ayah. But were they happy with that? No, they weren't, because the lack of shukur is a mentality. If you have it, it will show uh, in different ways in different situations. Lack of when you're not grateful, you're just not grateful. Whether you have a lot or you have a little, you're someone who is not grateful. Nothing can change that. I want to bring something like a side thought a note for everyone. If you have a child or a friend, or if you're yourself, feel like you are someone who is not very grateful in life. Having a lot and having a little won't change it. If you have an ungrateful kid, taking away things from him won't change it. They won't become grateful for taking when you take things away. They'll do what Sabah did here. Because the problem is the mentality. The problem is how they think, it's not what they have. Are you understand what I'm saying here? The problem is not what they have, it's how they thought. Sabah's problem was they did not submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a society in showing, in showing shukr. They didn't do it, the mentality wasn't there. They didn't understand, that wasn't a part of their value system. It wasn't a part of who they were. And because it wasn't, nothing helped them. Nothing really changed for them. It was taken away. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't take away everything. He substituted. It was just a shift. Just made them work a bit harder for, for things. So maybe they, they would think. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very wise. He doesn't take everything away. That's what we do when we don't like, the, when our kids don't, uh, you know, don't, aren't grateful. You take the toy away. No more. 
Right? You think he's going to come grateful. He's not going to come grateful. That definitely doesn't work. What Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did was something different. He made them work for it a bit more. He made it harder for them to get what they wanted to get. But for Sabah, they still didn't do it. They still didn't show shukr. They still couldn't do it. فَقَالُوا And when that all happened for them, see, are you, are you paying attention to, the, to how it works? They were told, سِيرُوا فِيهَا لَيَالِيَ وَأَيَّامًا آمِينَ Walk, walk amongst these, these, safe, these safe routes on these stops up to the north. Walk safely. You're going to be safe. Don't worry. You're going to make it there and back. You'll make enough money. So they, it wasn't they were told, now you're going to be starved to death and punished. No, سِيرُوا آمِينَ Walk in safety. Go make your money but not as easy as it was before. Maybe you learn to be a bit more thankful. فَقَالُوا So what did they say? You would think at this point they would figure out, yeah, we were an ungrateful bunch of people. We were mean, we were cruel, we were uh, stingy, uh, we were wasteful, and we did not show Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala shukr even though our prophets told us to. We weren't a thankful and grateful society. We didn't, no one benefited from us. Is it that they were punished? So, uh, uh, let me just tell you what they said and you'll know if they did. <laughs> yeah, well, he, this is what they said. فَقَالُوا What did they say? رَبَّنَا O oh our Lord بَاعِدْ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا Make it worse. Make it worse. Make, 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 the, make our routes even longer, Ya Rabb. You know when someone uh, uh, doesn't go their way so they start uh, making dua against themselves. And when they don't like it, you take away something from your kid and he goes inside and he starts breaking all his other toys. Ever, ever, ever done that before? When your dad did something to you, so you go and you punish yourself by just smashing something that you like. And then you sit there and feel like, what an idiot. <laughs> I, just, I just smashed something else that I, that, I, that I liked a minute ago. Right? Because you didn't accept the punishment. You didn't accept what happened. So you took it out on yourself. You took it out on what was happening. You became someone who was angry, disgruntled. Someone who was hateful. Someone who basically acted in a very selfish and childish manner. فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا Your Lord. So they're talking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're talking to anyone else. بَاعِدْ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا Make this worse. It's not worse enough. You haven't made this worse enough, Ya Rabb. Make this worse for us. You can't do worse than this. You can't make it longer. Make it longer. Very rude. Very rude. Very disrespectful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Full of, full of hate. Full of anger. Full of objection to Him. Are you understanding the idea? Full of objection. They don't want it. They didn't say, Alhamdulillah for what we have right now. Alhamdulillah, at least we have, at least we have a safe route to a place where we can go trade, come back and make money. At least we have that. Alhamdulillah, we were very just ungrateful before. No, make this worse. It can't be worse. I saw, I've seen this uh, mentality. I'm not sure if you've uh, ever come across it or if you yeah, any, uh, have ever witnessed it in yourself or in others. I've seen it. I've seen it many times. I've heard it a lot. And it's, yeah, and it's very, and it, even, 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 even older people. I've seen, it, I've seen it more from older people than children. I've actually seen it from, yeah, I've seen it more in older ages than I've seen it in, in myself as a child. People become like that. They become hateful. They become hateful because they didn't get their way one or two or three times. Now they're hateful. Now they're angry. Now nothing is worth living for. Now, now nothing is worth going for anymore. And they're just, they're just filled with, with spite and with anger. Be very careful when this happens inside. You don't get your way, you decide just to destroy everything. Sometimes you're playing a game and you lose because someone didn't do something, so you start scoring on yourself. Right? Or you, or you just, or you throw the game. Right? You throw the game. That's a word that every, every gamer knows what I'm saying. Throwing the game. I'm going to throw. Why are you going to throw? Well, because you didn't, at that moment, you didn't do what you needed to do. And that pissed me off and now I'm petty and I'm going to throw the game. And you throw the game. Why? There's no, that's dumb. That no, you, everyone knows that's not a good way. Even when you do it, you know you're wrong. <laughs> Even when you're doing it and you're so angry and you're throwing the game and you're getting some, some good feeling that you threw the game and you, you know, but you know it's wrong. Right? And, and, they, and, and this is, of course, these are simple examples that I'm giving you that we don't, but he here is an ultimate example. فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا They call their Lord. They weren't kuffar. And it's, you see what I'm saying? Someone who is a kafir, who doesn't believe in Allah, would he call upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Right? Like, uh, because sometimes you don't understand how the ayat work. They didn't say, uh, they, 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 they acknowledge God. They, they're speaking to Him. They're making dua. رَبَّنَا They're talking to their Lord. So when he says kafur, he's not talking about those who don't believe in Him. He's talking about those who weren't grateful. You have, to, you have to see these differences in the Qur'an. These are very subtle differences that make a huge... They, they, you know, it, it makes a big difference in how you, understand the Quran, how you understand the Mus'haf altogether. These subtle little things that you find, usages of words that, he, that you have, that will make huge differences in how you interpret what you're reading. فَقَالُوا رَبَّنَا O oh our Lord, بَاعِدْ بَيْنَ أَسْفَارِنَا Increase the distance between our, in our, in our, in our, uh, in our uh, travels. 
may this be worse upon us. May, may we find it more difficult to go and find money. Why is it just this difficult? Huh? Can it be worse, Ya Rab? Throw at us more. That's the best you can do? You're challenging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Being rude. وَظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ And with that, they, they oppressed themselves. They oppressed themselves when they did that. They only hurt themselves. فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَادِيثِ And we did exactly what they asked for. And they, become, they became a story that it was only told. A hadith means just a story. When someone, when the Quran uses this a lot. فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَادِيثِ They became stories. Meaning they were done. Now we just talked about them. Once there was a great group called Seba, just like I'm doing right now. They don't exist anymore. There's nothing left of them. فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَادِيثِ وَمَزَّقْنَاهُمْ When he tore them. كُلَّ مُمَزَّقْ in, in every direction. They were torn from within, in every way, in every direction. Yes. Same seven, exact same seven, but it's a different story there. But there's a different story, like no, no, uh, b b a bit after. So this is how it started, and then it'll end differently. It'll end in a good way for them, but that's like later on. But you're right, it's the same seven. Seven is only a few times in the Quran. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So so if you go back to the to the beginning, exactly. If you go back to the beginning of the surah, right, uh, to, to see the consistency, the continuity, to ayahs number seven, when he said, قَالَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا هَلَّ دُلُّكُمْ عَلَى رَجُلٍ يُنَبِّئُكُمْ إِذَا مُزِّقْتُمْ كُلَّ مُمَزَّقٍ إِنَّكُم لَفِي خَلْقٍ جَدِيدٍ the, the, the disbelievers said, how we show you a person who tells you that when you are torn in every direction, when you're in, in your grave, and there's nothing left of you, that you will give, be given life again, right? So that concept of being torn in every direction was, uh, exists for the, for the individual when, when, when they're dead. Uh, and Allah subhanahu will bring them back together and exists also for societies and Allah subhanahu wa can bring them back together as well meaning this wasn't the end for Saba Saba actually did find prosperity through Bilqis and through Sulaiman alayhi they found prosperity and they stood up again but it was after, after a long time it was after they changed the way they thought and they changed their mentality and changed the way they functioned it was only after that that Allah subhanahu wa granted them it again but just like you could be torn in your grave and nothing's left of you and then you're brought back together again as one it'll happen to groups and it can, you can be brought back as one again. Yes. The words only used in this surah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, no, there, there's, there's one more usage of it in the Quran, but it's very unique to Surah Saba in terms of the re repetition of it in two, in two different places. And that was the end. Saba didn't have the strength they had again until a very, very long time. Inna fi dhalika, indeed within this story, la ayat or signs. Li kulli, it's beautiful how it ends. Li kulli sabbarin. Shakur. Right? <laughs> because you live between two situations. There's really no other, there's no, there's no third option. Either things are difficult, so you're showing sabr, you're in continuous perseverance, it's hard right now, I'm tired, I don't, things aren't going my way, so I'm going to show perseverance, or it's easy, and I'm enjoying it, so I'm going to show shukur, I'm going to be grateful. There is no third option. There's no neutral position for the human being. If you think you're in a neutral sp spot, you're in the spot of shukr, you just don't notice it. Shaitan just beat you to it, to make you think that you're is a neutral. There's no neutral spot. If you think it's neutral, then you're in a point of shukr and you should be showing gratitude right now. But it's one of two things. It's either sabr or it's shukr. In in these two stories that you just re heard are signs for every persevering person and every grateful person. So the, he who is perseverant and grateful will find ayat here, will find, will find uh, benefits from these two stories. And, and the usage of Sabbar Shakur, of course, makes this even more clear in terms of what the surah is talking about. Yes, it was, it was made more difficult for the people of Sabbah. It was made more difficult. Before it was made easy and they didn't show Shukur. The group, as a society, they weren't grateful, so they lost what they had. The barakah was taken away. The barakah stayed in the, in the hands of those who were, a bit more, who were more grateful, who were much more grateful with what they had. And instead of them being perseverant when things were difficult, they became spiteful and angry and petty. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ended them completely. And within that, you should find uh, a sign. When you, when, when you refuse to be perseverant or you refuse to be grateful, you're only punishing yourself. You don't punish anyone else. The punishment comes back to you. The harm hits you. So if it's easy, be grateful and that will help you. And if it's hard, be persevering and that's going to help you too. If you, don't, if you don't show perseverance, it's not going to help anyone else. When you decide to end your life or, 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 or worsen your life or act in a way where you don't care, no one's going you know, no to be harmed from this but yourself. You're just harming yourself. And why are you harming yourself? What's the point? 
Who are you angry at? Who are you angry at? Who are you mad at? Who are you what point are you trying to make here? This is your life. In the, in this akhirah where you're going to be asked about everything. You're not punishing anyone but yourself. Seba were petty. They were given, they didn't show gra gratitude, it was taken away, they became more uh, yani, uh, spiteful and then they lost everything. Nothing was left of them. It was until generations later that Balqis came and Sulaiman was there and things. And then it happened again and it was destroyed again. And some, some historians say it was in the opposite way. I mean, Balqis was at the beginning. And I, and I, and I kind of think that makes sense, but because they, there's a lack of uh, agreement amongst historians and scholars, I don't know which one it is. Some scholars say that it was generations after this group that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected Saba, I mean Saba gained strength again. It was Balqis who brought them forward and then the, the interaction with Sulaiman happened. And other stories say that it was Balqis at the beginning and then they became la and then they lost everything and then uh, which Allahu alam it could be it could be more likely as well i don't know to be honest there's there's lack of uh, it, there's lack of clarity on this issue yeah it could be it could be it could be that that but that balqis at the beginning and then and, and they were given prosperity and then they became they, they they lacked gratitude for generations after that and then they were destroyed and then the arabs went into the went into arabia but because there's historians who talk about two catastrophes in yemen so this is being the first one and another one that would have come later. I'm not, I'm not fully sure. But either way, if you took the first one, that's uh, the second option, that's fine as well. If you take that uh, Balqis was before and this was the end of Saba, well, this is where Arabs came from. So the Arabs who lived or, or populated Arabia basically came, basically came from, these, uh, you know, from, from this origin here. They were all in that. In Saba, they were very prosperous and then they had to go in all the different directions and live all around. And there were tribes and things kind of moved from there. Wallahu ta'ala alam, we're not sure. What's more important, of course, is more than that, because that's not too important, is the actual lesson that is taken from this. The, the lesson of how societies have to, the, the form of submission that societies show is gratitude is being grateful, is not wasting what they have, is using it for good and not harming others with it. This is how societies show gratitude. And the moment they don't, Barakah is taken away. And when Barakah is taken away, the question is asked, how do, you, how do societies react to when Barakah is lost? Do they become more petty and more spiteful and more hateful? And they lose their ethics and they lose their values and they become, or do they become better and they show perseverance? Which one is it? I can tell you yeah, firsthand that we're not doing it right that we're not, we're not doing it right at all. Those of us who are in, a, yani in societies that should be showing shukr are, are, are lacking. And those of us who are in societies who have to show sabr are lacking as well. And it's an important, it's an important balance. You, ha you have no other choice. You can't become, you can't do what Sabah did. Or else, فَجَعَلْنَاهُمْ أَحَادِيثٌ وَمَزَّقْنَاهُمْ كُلَّ مُمَزَّقٍ And they were torn in every direction. Nothing was left of them to speak of. Okay. Those are two stories. We're going to recite two more verses, inshallah, today. I think we have enough time to do so. Um, I, I will, uh, and you won't hide it. These are one of the most, two of the most beautiful surah verses in the whole surah, by far. Uh, they're two of my favorite of the whole Quran. I quote these uh, very often. Um, it's, uh, it's one of the reasons I enjoy reading Surah Sabah. So I'll recite them, and then we'll talk about the meanings. وَلَقَدْ صَدَّقَ عَلَيْهِمْ إِبْلِيسُ فَاتَّبَعُوهُ إِلَّا فَرِيقًا مِّنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَمَا كَانَ لَهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِّنْ سُلْطَانٍ إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِالْآخِرَةِ مِمَّنْ هُوَ مِنْهَا فِي شَكٍّ وَرَبُّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَفِيظٌ وَلَقَدْ صَدَّقَ عَلَيْهِمْ إِبْلِيسُ ظَنَّهُ Indeed, Iblis uh, made an assumption that they proved truthful upon themselves. So let's go back now, let's rewind quickly, uh, or yeah, going back to the beginning of all this, when Iblis told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, لَأُغْوِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْمَعِينَ If you, لَنَأَخَرْتَنِي 
ila yawm al ila yawm al qiyamati la ahtanikanna dhurriyatahu illa qalila i am going to uh, i'm going to uh, b b mislead all of them just give me the chance don't take me now let me live until yawm al qiyamah and i'm going to prove to you that they are worthless that they are that, that they are not grateful that they will not sh uh, follow your word and you wala tajidu aktharahum Shakirin, just so that you see that the, the parallels here, and you will not find most of them to be uh, grateful at all, Ya Rabbi. You will give them, and, they, and I will prove to you that they are not grateful. Yeah, you're going to punish me for what I did. I will prove to you that Adam, who you, whom you said is better than me, and you asked me to, pros uh, yeah, to pr uh, uh, prostrate uh, for or to, towards, is not better than me. I will show you that all his. I, I will. I will mislead everyone. And I'll prove to you what I tell you to Akhtarahum Shakirin. You will not find most of them, just so you see the parallels of the, of the, of the story, to be grateful. That's what he said. So this is Iblis, uh, his, his assumption. This is his, uh, his run. Run means an assumption. What he, what he thinks is most likely going to happen. He doesn't have clear evidence uh, of certainty that it will happen. But it's what he thinks is most likely going to happen. So every time we do it, we are basically proving him right. That means every time you do it, you prove him right. And he gets to say, see, told you. See, they're, they're, they're simple. They're, they're not very hard. Ya Rabbi, it's easy. It's easy. They're not grateful. And he, he, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. I, I did this in Ramadan. We talked about this in some length. That this is basically Iblis' challenge. He challenged God. Uh, philosophically, he challenged him. He told him that they're not, I don't think they're better than me. I'm going to prove to you that they're not. I think, I think Ya Rabbi made a, a judgment call that was wrong. That's, that's basically what Iblis is trying to say. That you did, it wasn't right. right. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, no, no, I know what I'm doing. Amongst these people, amongst them are going to be some of the best ever to live. Amongst them are going to be so, so selfless and so grateful and so perseverant and so pure that it's going to make up for all the garbage that others are going to do. And they're going to be given a fair chance, so there's no reason for it not to be proper. But Iblis' idea is that he's not, he's, not, he's not better, he's not better than our grateful, I am better. So, وَلَقَدْ صَدَّقَ عَلَيْهِمْ إِبْلِيسُ فَنَّهُمْ Basically what the ayah is saying, and in these people, they proved Iblis right. They proved his assumption to be true. فَاتَّبَعُوهُ And they followed him. I love this part of the verse. Every time you, you, you refuse to be grateful, and you walk down the wrong path, you're just proving Iblis right. And you're just walking down the path that he so generously drew for you in, the, in a different direction. Proving that, yeah, now nah, you're not grateful. Just like he said, he, he called it. <laughs> Iblis called it first day. He looked at you and said, I said you do aktharahum shaykh, you won't find most of them to be grateful. And now you're doing it, yeah, you're proving it. You don't like to prove your enemy right, do you? And the worst thing in the world is to prove someone you don't like right, if, if they say something about you. It's actually a tactic of terbiyah that uh, they used to use back in the day. It's a really bad one, but it, it, it worked. If, if you had a hard-headed kid, like someone who was stubborn as heck, if you have a stubborn kid, use this. Find someone who doesn't really matter in his life, or even if he doesn't matter, to, you know, I need to, to say something bad about him, right? Especially if it's stubborn. Some kids, they, they're like uh, uh, springs. If you, the more you have to push them down to, for them to, to fly up. They don't, uh, it doesn't work. The positive reinforcement doesn't really work. So sometimes they need some negative reinforcement for it to work. But no, hitting doesn't work. But this does. Uh, someone say, you know what, no, I don't think he's going to make anything. He's, he's, he's a loser. Uh, I can see it in him. Now this kid, if he's stubborn enough, he'll, he'll spend the rest of his days trying to achieve just to prove that person wrong. And I had someone do that to me when I was a kid, only to find out that it was all set. Yeah, he played. It was, they played me, basically, when I was just, from age 6 to age 8. I was played for two years, trying to prove someone wrong that just did it just to yeah, yeah, motivate me to do something good. Yeah, but anyways, it, 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 is, you know, it, wasn't, it actually worked. Yeah, it, it is a tactic that is used sometimes. Sometimes, just not to prove someone right, you will do everything. You will go be, yeah, out and beyond. You will starve yourself just not to prove someone right. I know uh, I, I, I have a cousin who left the house, left his home and, and, and traveled. And his, and his father told him, you're not going to make it, don't go. So he went anyway, and he starved. Well, he starved for years. Yeah, he was starving. He had nothing, but he didn't want to come home, so his father yeah, he wouldn't, uh, prove, he wouldn't prove his father right. And he stayed, and he made it. And he made money, and he, and he came back again. And he always used to say, like, the only reason that I made it is because my father gave me the challenge, and I, and I had to prove myself. To Sometimes proving yourself is, is, is what is the motivation you need to achieve. Sometimes it is. And I'll remind you of Iblis. He made an assumption about each and every one of us. Yeah, that you're not going to do it. You're not going to. You can't do it. You're selfish by nature. He's going to prove that you're selfish. That you're not grateful. That you're not someone who's perseverant. Basically, that we're all, you know, 
<laughs> Anyways, we're not, we're not good yet, yeah, basically what, what he's saying. So every time you do, and you do it, you're just proving him right. And you're allowing him to say, see, Arab? Just like I told you. Yeah, they're all garbage. Just like I said. Or, or you go ahead and you turn, turn things around. And you prove him wrong. وَلَقَدْ صَدَّقَ عَلَيْهِمْ إِبْلِيسُ ظَنَّ I love this eye. It's, very, it's, very, it's a very clear, it's a very clear one. It's very to the point. They, what, they, what Sabah did, is that they had, they, they proved Iblis and his assumptions to be truthful. They proved him right. فَتَّبَعُهُ And they followed him and they did exactly what he said that they were going, they were going to do. What he said that they were going to do. إِلَّا Yes, go ahead, go ahead. I just want to ask, uh, yeah. is expectation fair? Yeah, exactly. Like he, he sets an expectation. Exactly. Yeah, so another way of putting it is expectation, yeah. And is it fair to say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets another expectation? Sets another expectation, exactly. Yeah, another way to put it is actually the concept of expectations. What's expected of you? And what? Uh, and that's actually even a better way of actually putting it. Like Allah Is Iblis put expectations for us? <laughs> and either you prove him right and you meet them or you don't meet them. Or you meet the expectations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put for you. That you are capable of meaning. The thing is, you know, about the human being, the, the cool part about it is that you, you, you have the potential and the ability to meet either expectations. Like this is the cool part of being a person, is that you can, do, you, you can meet either. You're not forced to meet one of them. You're not, you're not put in a position where you have to meet this one. No, no, you can meet any of them. But when you do, you're proving one party right and you're proving one party wrong. And it's, it depends, is it Iblis or is it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who you're going to prove right? But when they followed Iblis and they met these expectations, I guess, illa. I always, always take time and focus on everything before the word illa, just to bother everyone. And then so you can listen to the word illa after it. Because <laughs> after the word illa means accept. So if I, I focus a lot on the first part, so you, you get all yeah, and you're bothered and you're uncomfortable, and then you hear there's an, there's an exception to the rule. There's always an exception to the rule. Illa, accept. Fariqam min al-mu'mineen, a group of believers. Accept a group of believers. Mu'mineen. Those who believed didn't prove Iblis right, didn't meet his expectations didn't walk down the road that he put for them. And they, and they, did, and they did it right. إِلَّا فَرِيقًا مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ There's always going to be a group of believers, always going to be a group of mu'mineen who will, will do it right, who will, will play their role, who will fulfill their, uh, their covenant and will do what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asked them to do. So choose what you want. It's always your choice. Always has been and always will be. وَمَا كَانَ لَهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ This is an important, uh, there's a lot of different, yeah, there's a lot of uh, little Parts here of understanding this ayah. وَمَا كَانَ لَهُ And there was never really for him, for Iblis, عَلَيْهِمْ Upon the people who followed him, or, or the, upon the people who proved him right, there was never really for Iblis, upon those who followed him, مِنْ سُلْطَانٍ Any sort or any form of uh, control. Sultan in its basic meaning uh, means control. Just to break it down to the most basic of its meanings, is just control. Meaning there was never ever for Iblis upon the people who followed him and did what he said and you know, proved him right, any form of control at all. He didn't control them at all. Then why is, why is Iblis there to begin with? What's the whole point of Iblis being there? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his divine, his divine wisdom had Iblis there, like this is not something that went against his will, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Iblis made a few uh, choices that were wrong, but Allah subhanahu wa divine wisdom is to have someone there to suggest to you a diff an alternative way of life, to make this interesting, to make this worthy of, of, ben of, uh, of reward. If you're going to be rewarded with an infinite number of years or an infinite period uh, of, of, uh, of bliss from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there has to be something worthy of it because or else it's not fair it's not fair to the malaika and to all the other creations that he made that don't have choice so if it's really simple I mean there's really only one choice to choose then how are you different than malaika really nothing they only, they only have one cho choice to make every time they make it and they're not being uh, rewarded for anything Jannah is not made for them they're not going to go live there they can continue to follow the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in their own way they're not going to be given that however you uh, yeah, the veil is going to be lifted and you're going to be you're going to see everything hear everything understand everything and be able to explore the infinite universe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created and take all in all the knowledge and soak in all the all the blessings and, and that is something that yeah, that's a big deal so in order for that to be an option for you the fact that 
for you to achieve that, it has to be a bit of a challenge. There has to be something there. So Iblis, that was, that's why Iblis is there. He doesn't control you. He's not there to control you. He's not a force of nature that you can't stop. No, no. It's, he's just there uh, to, to, make, to put expectations, uh, to, to make suggestions, to, to maybe make things a bit more difficult for you to choose. But at the end of the day, he does not control anything. His control is zero. وَمَا كَانَ لَهُ عَلَيْهِمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانِ This is a definite ayah in the Qur'an that has no other way to be understood. I mean, there's no alternative way of, of, of explaining this ayah. He did not have, upon those who followed him, any form of control at all. Illa, and then there's, there's another exception here. But here's an exception from different, of, of, of a different nature. He's not, the, the, the exception here is not to say that oh, 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 this, these are the people he had control over. No, he said, here the exception is the only reason we allowed him to exist to begin with, as long as there's no control, he doesn't control anyone, then why is he existing? Why is this whole story here? لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِالْآخِرَةِ مِمَّنْ هُوَ مِنْهَا فِي شَكْ The reason for all this, the reason for Iblis and for his assumptions, and for those who followed him and those who didn't, and the fact that he doesn't have any control, but he is able of giving you some bad ideas. The reason of all this, إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمْ So that we can know. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala already knows. Here the knowledge is knowledge of, uh, of acceptance of the other party. Meaning the knowledge here is not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala didn't know beforehand. It's so that we accept His knowledge subhanahu wa ta'ala as a means uh, for consequences. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took my life or your life right now and said, okay, had you lived another 30 years, you're going to do all these bad things and all these bad things, if you add them up, uh, yeah, you should go to Jahannam now because you wouldn't accept it. Would you accept it? Not a chance. Not a chance. You would have the strongest yeah, I mean, uh, uh, case in his court to prove that he is unjust and you completely unaccepted. Because you didn't do it. But he tell you, I know it. And I know all. So what I know is right. But you still wouldn't accept it. Right? And just like, but you would be okay with the other side, but you wouldn't be okay with that. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts this, uh, when He says, لِنَعْلَمْ for us to know, it's not for Him because He didn't know previously. The idea here is for the knowledge to be something that the other party accepts as well. إِلَّا لِنَعْلَمَ مَنْ يُؤْمِنُ بِالْآخِرَةِ Those who believe in the hereafter. مِمَّنْ هُوَ مِنْهَا فِي شَكْ And differentiate them from those who are in doubt of it. It's a very scary ayah in the Quran. It's very unique. I don't, there's no other ayah in the Quran that is like this one. It's the only ayah in the Quran that has this, this wording in this way. If you look at the, are you seeing the parallels from the introduction? The, the, the surah begot with, started with hamd, and then all we heard was shukr throughout. And it, what was the other thing the surah talked about? If you go back, walahu alhamdu fil akhirah, right? And there's no ula, just akhirah, talking about akhirah. And then the other one was knowledge, which is coming very soon. Coming very soon. But we heard that the first part of shukr is now clear. Here's a part of akhirah. Societies, in order for societies to submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the concept of hamd, the concept of the hereafter, and the concept of knowledge have to be three, uh, yeah, I need, uh, three basic elements in order for them to start. You have to have a society that is based on gratitude, that is based on positivity and optimism, knowing what the good things that we have, using them for khair and then building on them. You have to believe in hereafter. There's no number, amount of cameras in the world that can make us behave properly. Unless we believe in a hereafter. Unless you believe that you're going to be judged and punished for what you do, you're not going to behave. You're going to find a way to beat the system. And human beings always find a way to beat the system. They always do. Unless you have some intrinsic uh, yani, motivation, which is akhirah. So the only reason Iblis existed, and the only reason he was capable of doing it, because he didn't have any control, but the only reason he was there is for us to establish those who believe in the hereafter with certainty and those who are in doubt of it. That's it. That's the only reason Iblis is here. He is here to establish a difference, like for the line to be drawn between those who believe in Akhirah, truthfully, with certainty, with depth, and those who are in doubt of it. He didn't say those who disbelieve in it. Doesn't matter. Uh, doubt and disbelief are all the same. Either you believe in Akhirah or whatever. <laughs> Just whatever after that, who cares? I, I know, I, can, I don't care. Do you believe in it? I am, okay, then just stand over there. Doesn't matter. But no, I'm standing with someone who doesn't believe in it at all. I don't, it doesn't matter anymore. It's either this side or everything else is just whatever. Because when, you, when you're wondering why, وَرَبُّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَفِيظٍ And your Lord upon a, is a hafil. Hafil is the encompasser of everything. And He knows all. And He is... Yeah, hafil is the biggest name of knowledge that we have. Hafil is the one who encompasses everything under Him. 
He knows all, he is wise of all, subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is aware of all, and he deals with all. So nothing falls in between, between the cracks in terms of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's knowledge or abilities. But why is this such an important thing? Because when you believe in Akhirah, or you don't believe in Akhirah, it doesn't show when things are going well for you. It doesn't, I don't know if you, you believe in Akhirah or not when things are going well. When, it's, when things are happening the way you want them to happen, when you are living a life of prosperity and of, and of wealth and of health and of, and of uh, fulfillment of your, of your basic needs. I can't figure out if you believe in Akhirah or not. Because you could be following the rules and being a good person because it's very self-serving at that moment. When you have the upper hand, you have more money, you want everyone to follow the rules. Because if they don't follow the rules, you're going to lose what you got. If I'm rich and you're, and, and you're poor, well, I, it's, is it not in my best interest for uh, stealing to be haram? Of course it is. If it wasn't, I, am, I, am, I have the lower hand here. Because I have nothing to steal from you, but I have everything to lose. <laughs> so it's, it's self-serving when I have a lot. But when I don't have anything, stealing being haram is, is problematic. It's problematic. So if I'm in doubt of, some, of, of akhirah, just in doubt of it, it's going to show the moment I, things aren't going my way. It has to be certainty. Because it will only show, because belief in Akhirah only shows when things are really, really difficult. It doesn't show when things are easy. So you can't have it 80% or 70%. You can't. It's not going to do its job. It has to be certainty. I mean, you have to be certain that you're going to be resurrected after you die. Wait until I die. Allahu Akbar. Allah. It's, it's, a very, it's a very subtle point that you have to pay attention to and try to understand. The reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is establishing the difference between those who are certain of Akhirah and those who are in even a slight amount of doubt, meaning the issue not being the opposite. Like the opposite could be those who disbelieve in Akhirah and those who are kind of, all right, like they're, they're in doubt of it. No, no, he doesn't want that. He, either he wants full belief in Akhirah, any amount of doubt is not wanted. Why? Because belief in Akhirah only works if it comes in full. Because it's only going to show when things are difficult. So if you have a bit of doubt, that bit of doubt that you have, when things are difficult, is going to come into play and cause you not to behave the way you should behave had you actually believed in Akhirah to begin with. Is that, is that making sense? I mean, the belief in Akhirah is only going to function when things are very difficult for you. So if there's a bit of doubt, that bit of doubt, the moment things are difficult is going to come and flourish. That's where it's going to, this bit of doubt is going to come and make you make that mistake. When you're sitting there thinking to yourself, what do I do? Do I take the 50 grand extra that I shouldn't be taking here? And my fulan needs it and I need it and I'm in debt and my, my family is, uh, yeah, need, uh, needs this and my son needs this or my daughter is, in, is sick. Or, and, you're, and, you're, and you're put in that situation where do I take it or do I don't take it? And then you're left with your akhirah. Do you believe in akhirah? Do you believe that you take this, you're going to be held accountable for it? Do you actually understand what that means? If it's certain, then you will not touch it. If, you, if, it, if there's a bit of doubt, you'll take it. You'll take it. Should I say it haq right now or should I lie? Should my tongue speak the truth or should I say something else different? And maybe lose my head or what, which one is it? Well, it depends. Do you believe in Akhirah or do you not believe in Akhirah? Is there doubt in your belief in Akhirah? If there's doubt in your belief in Akhirah, you're probably going to make the wrong choice. And this is what the ayah is saying. Right? It's, a very, it's a very difficult ayah. It's a very heavy one. I, I, I invite you to read, to read it time, time and time again to understand what he is saying here. Iblis, many, of, many people, many people uh, have proven Iblis' point right and they followed him except a small group of believers and the only reason that Iblis existed because he had no control over any of them was for us to establish the difference between those who truly believed in the hereafter and those who had a slight amount of doubt مِمَّنْ هُوَ مِنْهَا فِي شَكٍ If you have doubt it's going to be problematic وَرَبُّكَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَفِيظٍ Your Lord encompasses all he sees it all, he knows it, he knows exactly whether you have that doubt or you don't. But you have to prove that to yourself. Meaning you're going to be put in enough situations in your life. So you prove to yourself. And you, you prove through your actions, are you certain about Akhirah? Or like everyone else, are you just in a... You, have, you, have a, you just have a different amount of doubt. Maybe someone has a bit more doubt than you do. Yeah, and the Quran is saying there's no difference between someone with just 90% amount of doubt in Akhirah and someone with 10% of uh, amount of doubt in Akhirah. Are you understanding the problem here? This is a very scary, scary thought to, to, to have. For you to, to, for you to be equal, in mean, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's eyes, from a social perspective, right, from a social perspective of submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
uh, to be equal, if you have 10% doubt in Akhirah, to be equal to someone who only has 10% certainty in Akhirah. I mean, 90% he thinks there's no Akhirah. And for you it's only 10%. It has to be 100% certainty that you are going to come back. You will die and you're going to come back. And everything you did, you're going to be held accountable for. May that be, may that be the most important part of your being. Why is it important for social, for, for social submission, for societies to function? Because the moment individuals in societies stop believing in accountability in the hereafter, you cannot, you cannot convince them to follow the rules when things go south. You cannot do it. Because if I only live once, and there is no akhirah, and I am poor as heck, and everyone around me has money, and everyone around me is corrupted, then why would I? Why would I let you enjoy the money? Why would I not enjoy it? Why wouldn't I go and take some of it for myself? How can you convince me? Tell me morality, I, why? What, what does morality mean? How has morality helped me? How has society helped me? I'm starving, I have nothing, you have everything. Why? This is not fair. I'm only going to live once. Yeah, but you know, society doesn't function. I don't care if society functions, I care that I live. I'm only going to live once anyway. Why do I care about how society works? I have nothing to lose. You have everything to lose. You're the one who cares about society functioning because you're rich, because you have everything. Of course you care about how things work. Uh, you smoke your pipe and watch your fire. Of course you care. It, ma it matters to you because you have a house to live in. I don't. The only way you can convince people in societies to actually accept that they need to play by the rules and they have to play properly is akhirah. That akhirah is there. That you will be held accountable if you harm, you steal, and you kill. I'm not saying that this is a way for us to hold down people who are less fortunate, but societies don't function without akhirah. They just don't. They just don't. I've, we have yet to see an example of a society that is completely yeah, 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 a faithless society, a fully faithless society go through difficulty and actually function properly with any level of morality or any level of ethic, eth ethics that, that, that will continue. That, that, is my, my, that is what I believe the surah is actually teaching us here. We'll stop with that inshallah. There's two more minutes. I will quickly uh, talk about uh, the, the fifth hikmah of the hikam of the pearls of wisdom of Ibn Ata'i al Sakandari, where he says, اجتهادك فيما ضمن لك وتقصيرك فيما طلب منك دليل على انطماس البصيرة منك For you to put effort in things that have already been taken care of for you and to slack and to fall short in achieving things that you were asked to do shows that you have no clarity of vision and no clear understanding from what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants For you to put effort in trying to achieve things that he has already taken care of for you, for you subhanahu wa ta'ala. And on the other hand, fall behind and slack. And what he told you to do, what you were asked to do, is a clear piece of evidence that you have no basira. Basira is not the ability to see. Basira is the ability to understand what you're seeing, to understand what was said to you to begin with. And there are so many examples of this in Islam, in our lives, that it's one of the most important pearls of wisdom that we have from him. You know, we spend so much time trying to achieve things that we were not ever asked to try and achieve and we leave the stuff that we were clearly and explicit, explicitly told to do. I mean, things that we were very clearly told, you need to do this, we leave and we focus on other stuff that are less important or things that he never actually asked us to do to begin with or things he took care of us, for us all together. And we focus on the parts that he made very clear, this is what I want you to focus on, do this. And that shows that there is no basira. That it, says it, it, it has nothing to do with, with whether you can see with your eyes or you can't see with your eyes. It, has, has an, it, ha, it talks about whether you can see with your heart or you can't see with your heart. I'll explain that a bit more next week, inshallah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala.